If you would take your song books and stand, turn to page 56. Page 56. Stand as you sing. When we all get to heaven. Page 56. Stand as you sing. Sing the I don't care how, try, how hard you try, you're not going to get that sound right. <laughs> Page 56. See the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy. tell you that if you don't have contact information for your missionary on your on your handout let me know and I'll get it to you before you leave tonight okay we're gonna go ahead and start with brother Josh Oliver if you go ahead and bring your uh, letter forward sir and read that off for us for our missionaries to South Africa brother George Wyatt as a matter of fact I, I for those of you that need some context here for brother Wyatt this is the missionary a few months ago that was deemed uh, terminally ill with cancer and he requested prayers among all his supporting churches and just a, a short few months after that, after coming back to the United States, and the doctor said that he was going to die, God delivered him, and he's now back, I believe, back in the field. We're going to read a little bit about that. Why don't you come on up and read that for us tonight, brother? This is George and Jackie Wyatt. Dear praying friends, thank you for praying for us for our upcoming furlough. We plan to leave South Africa the first week of April and be in the States until the middle of October. All this is the Lord willing and the Lord guiding. We don't have any idea about how the things are in the churches right now, about having missionaries in to report. But if they want us to come, please contact us. We have a few meetings scheduled. We are doing well. Our health is still good, and we are still excited about what God is doing and plan to continue the work. We pray that we can organize the church and let the Bible before the end of the year. Amen. But we will trust in the Lord for clear leadership. We are also anticipating some will return to their home countries from the work in Damodorian and preach the gospel in the start of churches. We are excited about the Lord's leadership. We baptized two from the work at Damodorian, Amen. and we're planning to baptize five in Lethabile. But God has his plans, and there was no water, so we were unable to fill the baptistry. And as a result, I preached a bit longer, and the mother of one of the people to be baptized came to Christ and was born again. He said, Amen. <laughs> So when we baptize, we will have one more now. Praise the Lord. Thank you for praying for us faithfully and supporting us. We love and appreciate each of you. May God bless you and cause much fruit abound to your account. Yours for African souls, George and Jackie Wyatt. Amen, brother. Let me take a right on there real quick uh, to remind yourself. Yeah, there you go. Remind yourself to ask him when he's available to come in to preach for us and okay. let me know what dates he's got and we'll schedule him to come stop in and preach for us, okay? Sounds like a plan. Any, any particular date in mind? Uh, no, just ask him when he's available. Okay. We'll open his calendar up and we'll find out when it is. Let me know those dates and we'll find a date and we'll schedule it, okay? Let me know. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Thank you. All right, next we've got Brother David Brower. So, Brother Heron, if you go ahead and come up, and we'll, uh, we'll 
We'll take that and let it serve. Dear praying friends, the first photo was, was taken early in October. My member's husband generously donated an ice snowblower to our church. We needed to add storage space, so one of our men, Horst Wagner, worked with me on the project. The second photo was taken after our mid-October snowstorm. We had another heavy snowfall at the end of October. Usually our October snow melts away. I usually have the full month of October to bring in trees I've dropped. Uh, it's got fell in parentheses and left out in the, br uh, in the bush, an area where I have a permit to harvest firewood, not this year. I have uh, several cords of firewood still in links that are now buried in about three feet of snow. <laughs> I hadn't brought in enough firewood for the burning season. I remembered in the area with many standing dead tamaracks, which uh, makes the excellent heating I spent quite a bit of my spare time felling trees, uh, bucking, which is cutting them up, splitting the lengths, etc. Our temperatures remain mild, but our standard, our standards until mid-January. By our standards, I'm sorry, by our standards by mid-January. Since that time, we have actually. Since that time, we had actual temperatures as cold as minus 40 to minus 45 Fahrenheit. We've had wind chills as cold as 65, minus 65 Fahrenheit. Uh, we're doing well. Uh, we're keeping up with our wood supply, and it shows in uh, photos three and five. Uh, number three is a large 60-foot tamarack. I uh, had just uh, burning firewood and something, I'm sorry, I had just filled number four, uh, it's number photo, uh, photo four, as a pile of stove length and in need of, you get the idea, he's, wood is very important Amen. there uh, with the temperatures like that. Um, number five photo is a 75 inch long sled with freshly split pieces of burning firewood is something we do it's something we do harvesting is harvesting it it has become a hobby I very much enjoy people stop often to and visit while I am working in our parking area off of our back lane I've given out many tracks and had many good witnesses opportunities at such times on a regular basis yeah. ministry for me at the Correctional Center continues. Please pray for men like Campbell, who have made a profession of faith and continued to, with Bible studies and coursework. Several other, several others remain in the balance. Many are actively and regularly working on coursework that covers salvation and many other principles for living. <clears throat> we, please pray for Bill the donor of the snowmobile, or I'm sorry, snowblower, to be safe. <clears throat> We're hoping to soon have an opportunity to visit with him at his home. God continues to bless our services. When we were uh, able to meet those who listen over the phone, we are also receiving some encouraging feedback that those who watch our services online, thank you for your faithfulness and prayers and support for us as we serve here, David and Michelle, Brother uh, Breyer. Um, he's out of uh, Bible Baptist Church, uh, which is in um, 6367 Gateway Drive, Grand Forks, North Dakota. Um, he is uh, located up in Canada. I'm, I'm, I forget the exact location it doesn't give exact location but it's way up there it's up in the northern part of uh, Manitoba. 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 Yeah, Manitoba. I know I remember it being way up there so so anyway okay. thank you brother let me ask you all a question how, how many of you would be willing to get out and serve the Lord in 65 degrees below with wind chill 
Tell you what, you talk about men and women who have an eagerness to serve. Firewood is a rare commodity. Needless to say, our houses are either heated by electric or gas, one of the two. And uh, I barely got out in six degrees, let alone 65 below. Anyway, he needs prayer, so we're going to pray for him. Amen. Now, the next letter I'm going to read to you is from uh, Sam and Annie Varghese. They are native to India. And uh, we had them here just a few years back. I remember that they came and they were with us. And they are back in India delivering the gospel message to their people. And it says, Dear Pastor in the church, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hope this letter finds you all in good health and spirit. Let me first of all thank you for remembering us in your prayers as we have gone through some of the hardest times during the last couple of months. Both me and my wife had COVID-19, but the Lord healed us without having to go to the hospital. Praise God. He has been so good to us. Then we had to go through one of the hardest winter storms ever in Houston, Texas. To survive without power, heat, and water was not easy. We had the experience to live without power and running water, but not a bad icy storm like this. But the grace of God and the prayers of his saints brought us through safe. We were blessed with a granddaughter on the last week of January. Our daughter-in-law had a lot of complications with pregnancy due to the high blood pressure. She had to be hospitalized twice even after delivery. Now she feels better and taking rest at home. We shall appreciate your continued prayers for a complete recovery. The baby Abigail is doing good, and we praise God for her. Becky's daughter, Christina, our first granddaughter, is studying at Pensacola Christian College. Amen. We are grateful to the Southland Baptist Church and her pastor, Brother Jimmy Love, for doing everything for her admission and helping her to be at the college. Brother Jimmy Love is Brother James Love Sr.'s son, the pastor for Southland Baptist Church. What a blessing that is. We wanted to visit some churches who supported us for 45-plus years and thank them all for their faithfulness in standing with us all through those years. I also wanted to thank all those churches on behalf of the believers in India who came to the Lord due to their faithfulness, but due to, his, but due to this pandemic, I could not visit many churches since the virus is coming under control. I like to visit those churches where I had not visited and say thank you. It may be after April. Then we would like to go back to India where our soul is. The Lord has given ample opportunity to preach and teach them through Zoom. Thank God for that technology. Here I have been helping Grace Memorial Baptist Church preaching the word for the last few months. The Lord has been giving us a lot of opportunity to serve him and praise God for that. The persecution in India is increasing in many states. Some of our preacher brethren were arrested and were in jail for at least, listen here, three months. Three months. Did you know they arrested a preacher in Canada too and threw him in jail for preaching the gospel? They did. Isn't that something? Finally, two weeks ago, they were able to get a bail, and the court cases will continue for years. Prayers are requested for the persecuted Christians all over the world. Once again, thank you all for prayer partners, for your prayers and support. Yours and him, Sam and Anna Varghese, now, or Andy Varghese. I have already reached out to Brother Varghese. I've emailed him, but I'm going to commit to making a phone call and talking to him personally and seeing about getting a date for him to schedule to come in and be with us. And it'd be a blessing for you all to meet him. He's a wonderful man, a very intelligent man. And he is one that has come out of all of the gods they serve there in India. You know how many gods they serve in India? I think it's over 130 million gods they have in India alone. Can you imagine keeping up with that? That is just something else. And he's going back in and serving the one true God and trying to share that gospel with many. So I ask you pray for him again and uh, keep him in prayers. The next one we're going to have is uh, Brother Rundle with Larry Burbage. You bring that up, brother. Come on. All right. I have Paul and Sandy Burbage. It says, Greetings all. Sandy and I are so encouraged by God's working in our lives and in the ministry he has given us here in Halifax. Important announcement, all caps. With gratitude to our Lord Jesus Christ, we will make an annou this announcement. Brother James Mails and I, with our respectful, faithful wives, began this church planting ministry here in Halifax in the spring of 2017. With Jim taking the lead, what a blessed time it has been working with the males. We have seen the Lord do much last summer. Oh, do much. Last summer, the Lord began impressing upon me that he wanted me to take the lead in a ministry. I began praying, thinking maybe that meant starting another church plant here in Halifax, where the Lord has fixed our hearts. Months ago, Brother Males came up to me and asked, 
where I saw myself in the next year or so. I told him, I told him what the Lord had been doing in my life. Brother Males then told me, I lost my spot. There you go. Apologize. I told him what the Lord had been doing in my life. Brother Males then came up to me, told me that the Lord was working in his life to do another church plant and asked if taking the leadership of all nations Baptist church was something I wanted to do. The Lord com confirmed in my heart immediately that this was his will and the answer something was something I desired. The Lord confirmed Oh man. To the growing of our conviction of taking pastoral leadership in a ministry. Our hearts are here in Halifax with the disciples of the Lord has already disciples of the Lord has already added. And with the lost to whom we endeavor to preach the gospel daily. The turnover will take place this coming spring. Paul, Paul and Barnabas worked together, as did Paul and Timothy and Paul and Titus. The Lord used, them, used each of them and as a team. But there came a time when the Lord would move one servant on while the other stayed. We are so grateful for the time the Lord has allowed the males and us to labor side by side, but by faith, we see that the Lord is advancing his glorious great commission work by taking the males to the next place. He has, he has for them and expanding our stewardship here in Halifax. The spirit of the disciples here has been excellent. The last Sunday of February, the Lord brought six visitors. Pray for these folks. Call them Neil and family. Also pray for Ian and Sad. I have preached the gospel to these men previously, but the Lord, but the Lord uh, gave a couple divine appointments with them just this last week. Pray their hearts will be opened, and the world, and the word of God will have free course. We love each church and praise the Lord for your young partnership. We pray for you. Thank you for praying for us and your faithfulness to this work. And in love, Jesus, in love of Jesus Christ. God bless you in His Word and will. Love from Paul and Sandy Burbage. Amen. Thank you, brother. I, on your, uh, on the fourteen missionaries that I've got down here, I actually put Larry Burbage on there. Do me a favor, scratch that Larry. That's Paul Burbage. Okay, Paul Burbage. Uh, when you reach out to him, let me know, and we'll need to revisit if he's going to be taking the pastoral leadership of that church down there again. We support missionaries that plant, but as God leads them to those churches. That would no longer be considered a missionary. That would be he'd be considered a pastor. And we know, according to the Word of God, the church in which a pastor has been set, that church is responsible for tending to the needs of that pastor. So if he takes his role as a missionary to a to a pastor and takes the leadership there, we would no longer be able to support him as a missionary. So that may open up an opportunity for us. I need to speak more to him on that um, and text. Actually, to let me know when you've reached out to him, and then I'll I'll contact him. We'll talk more about his position as that pastor. Okay. And last but not least, we're going to go ahead and have Brother Bailey come up and share the updated letter for Brother Lee Watts. <laughs> okay, Brother Lee Watts, the Watts Family God and Country Ministry. You can hear his humor here. Uh, praise the Lord for his boundless mercies. God has provided a way for me to not have to rake so many leaves this autumn. How did he do that, you may ask? By having us remove a tree from our property. More specifically, we had it removed from our cars. During the ice storm last month, a tree trunk, and I don't know much about trees, but I think it was a redwood, fell across both our vehicles. No one was hurt. The tree, possibly it was a sequoia, did hit the house and cost more than $2,100 to have hauled away. A big thank you to all who gave to help ease that expense. The company had to use a crane since the tree was so big and heavy. As for the cars, Chrissy's was totaled while my roof was has some caving in and the windshield is shattered. Fortunately, my Donnie and Marie 8-track collection was intact. <laughs> I can hear him saying this. Um, as for the house, we have roof damage. A gutter was bashed up and the siding has a hole in it. 
So we are trusting in what the Bible says in Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Amen. We're excited to see what he does. Uh, Ministry-wise, I've been able to meet and pray with several of our legisl legislators across the state, have had the, held the Capitol Bible study. Uh, the devil sure has been fighting that effort sure. and continue to preach across the state. In March, I've been asked to teach some of my America's Christian Heritage series each Sunday night at Bluegrass Baptist in Georgetown, Kentucky. If your church doesn't have a Sunday evening service, then this is a lesson series I hope you'll come out and enjoy. Yeah. There are seven lessons to this series, and each stands on its own. If your church, patriotic or political group, would like me to come teach these for you, just let me know, and we'll set up the details. Here are the lesson topics. The biblical basis of the Constitution, biblical principles of the Bill of Rights, America's Christian foundations, the black-robed regiment, biblical principles about weapons, biblical principles about economics, and biblical principles about socialism. Hint, the Bible is against it. Videos are now on a new free speech service. Each Friday, I post a video on my channel called Patriot Point. It's about news from a Christian, conservative, and common sense point of view. YouTube sometimes censors me, as they are increasingly doing to conservatives. I've been in Facebook and YouTube jail so many times, I'm beginning to feel like Otis from Andy Griffith. <laughs> so, I'm now uh, posting Patriot Point videos on YouTube, and there's a, a site called BitChute, B-I-T-C-H-U-T-E, BitChute, uh, B-I-T-C-H-U-T-E, okay. um, at least on weeks without censorship, so there's the link. Uh, do you want me to read this sheet? No, thank you, Dan, thank you, brother. Oh, what is it? Yeah, top yeah. Ten. Yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Richard. All right, yeah, good. Go ahead, Thank Richard. you for yeah. setting that on a T for me. <laughs> the uh, David Letterman, no. The top ten reasons to not wear a mask. <laughs> I appreciate you letting me do this. You're welcome. Go ahead. Top ten reasons to not wear a mask. Number one, the Bible says thou shalt not lie. Since mass as shown above, and there's a picture, I'll read it. Uh, don't, since masks don't provide any protection to the wearer, or anyone else, it would be a lie to give others the impression wearing one is going to protect them. On the box of those blue masks, there's a warning label, the mask you see everybody wearing. On the box, the warning label says, this product is an ear loop mask. This product is not a respirator and will not provide any protection against COVID-19, coronavirus, or other viruses or contaminants. On the box. Number two. It says right on the mask box that masks do not provide any protection, so there is no reason to wear a mask because it doesn't protect the wearer or anyone else. Number three, if you've already had COVID-19 and recovered from it, then your body produced antibodies to kill off the germ and now keeps you from reproducing in your body. So when you cough or sneeze, COVID-19 won't be in the spray because your body isn't producing it. Therefore, there is no reason for people who have recovered from COVID-19 to wear a mask. Number four, Wearing a mask decreases oxygen, oxygen levels and increases uh, carbon dioxide levels that results in dizziness, sweating, and drowsiness, which is dangerous for drivers and detrimental to learning for students. Decreased oxygen levels is extra harmful for unborn babies and expectant mothers. Number five, there's a chart here. This is impressive. Since the mask mandate was issued in Kentucky July 9th, the number of reported virus cases increased by more than 600%. This fact alone proves that masks do not work. Since most people do wear masks, numbers should have gone down. Instead, they increased dramatically. Right. Number six, CDC report from July 2020 shows the more often people wear a mask, the more often they get sick. There's a chart here where they asked people when they wear masks. The choices were never, rarely, sometimes, often, and always. Check this out. Never mask wearers had 4% positive cases. Rarely wear a mask 4%. Sometimes wear a mask 7%. Often wear a mask 14%. And always wear a mask 71%. Oh. Should somebody pray? I'm getting mad. 
Okay, number seven, because masks don't stop bacteria, oh, I'm sorry, because masks stop bacteria, wearers breathe back in the bacteria. During the Spanish flu, when masks were worn, more people died from bacterial infections than did the virus. Number eight, masks are not even designed to stop viruses. They're designed to only stop bacteria. Viruses and bacteria are different things, which is why masks are useless against viruses. Viruses are much smaller than the pores. Number nine, those who have tested positive but don't have symptoms, uh, being asymptomatic, do not spread COVID-19. Um, and there's a link to that study. And then finally, number 10, if you don't have COVID-19, then you can't spread COVID-19. Therefore, if you are healthy, you do not need to wear a mask. Okay. <laughs> Anybody want any of those reread? For a second, he was going to start preaching. I had my Bible over here. I thought, well, if he goes on, I'm just going to, let, I'm just going to pray the Lord sets him on fire. We'll just keep on going. Amen? Hey, that's, that's a blessing. And, you know, the, the fact is the fact if, if a business is going to go under because somebody says you're not wearing a mask, obviously I'm going to do what I can. But, folks, the key it is is it just doesn't help you. It's not, it's not doing anything for you. I related to this when I was a kid, and I thought the boogeyman was in my room. Getting under the covers made me feel better. But if he was out there, what difference does it make? <laughs> it doesn't make a lick of difference. So there it is. Amen? So I appreciate all of you reading those letters, and again, I, I want to hold you all accountable and in making sure that you all reach out to these missionaries. Give them some encouragement. Find some encouraging words to give to them, and find something in that letter. If you must read it again, let them know we're praying for whatever prayer requests they had. Let the, let the Briars know you're praying for them with 65-degree wind chills, and let Brother Lee Watts know you're praying for them as they're getting their house prepared with $2,100 of expenses just to remove a tree. Whatever it is, make it personal. Let them know that we're praying for them or we're putting a great focus and emphasis on them this month. This is why we support our missionaries, folks. They're so, so important. Amen. Outside of that, I don't think we have any other letters as of right now. But again, you can't put those up until you have that contact made with those missionaries, okay? So I've got your names written down. I've got the spaces open. And hopefully we'll get, we'll get in contact with them. Amen. What a blessing. Last Sunday evening, who can tell us what we finished up studying? Finances. Thank you, Sister Cynthia. I appreciate that. Somebody says, why is that important? Well, if you were here, you'd know. Too bad. We're past it now. We're moving on to something else. Take your Bible to the book of James, if you will. We're going to just touch on this briefly tonight. And brethren, beloved, brothers and sisters, I got news for you. I hope, that, I hope this, in a way, whets your appetite to get excited about what the book or the epistle of James holds. This, this epistle, written by James himself, if you don't know much about this, I hope that God opens up your eyes. And my desire for you tonight, as we begin looking at the context of who the author is, is by the time you get home, all you can think about is getting laid down for bed and opening up your Bible and looking at the book of James. Start reading it, because it's good. It's rich. It has much to offer you as a Christian it has much to give you as an individual that follows Jesus Christ. And it talks a lot about your walk and faith with the Lord Jesus. But as we begin looking here, I want to emphasize a particular verse, and we're going to touch on this verse every single evening before we get into this particular book. That's James chapter 1 and verse 22. James chapter 1 and verse 22. The Bible says, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I'm going to do my best over the course of the next couple of Sunday evenings, however God leads me, however long he leads me to do this, to touch on the book of James, and we're going to go chronologically from chapter 1 all the way to the end of the book. But the emphasis we're always going to come back to every evening is James 1.22. Why is that? I believe it to be the great emphasis or the great focal point. If you miss this particular verse, you've missed everything in context to what James is writing about. Don't just be hearers of God's word. Oh, amen. That was great. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then you walk out and you're the same person every single day. And I've given an example of this on many occasions. My wife and I are getting ready to have a brand new baby girl, and I praise God for that. And she's going to be awfully cute. Babies are all cute. Some people would like to disagree with that, but I think all babies are cute. 
they run around sometimes. All they got is their diaper on. They're all cute running around with little, people call them rolls. You know what I'm talking about? The little rolls on them. You come over, oh, it's so cute. But if you come over to my house and my daughter 18 years from now is doing that, same thing when she's 18 years old, you're going to think, my goodness, what's the matter with that woman? <laughs> That's weird. You know, your second thought is, what's wrong with their parents? You know, that relates directly to God. If somebody sees you in your Christian walk 18 years from now and you're the exact same person, you still got your thumb in your mouth, you're a babe in Christ. You know, people are going to think, what's wrong with that person? You know what the second thought they're going to have? God ain't that effective in one's life. Your testimony for the Jesus Christ is in what you do, not in what you hear. Let's pray. My Heavenly Father, I love and thank you for all that you do. And may you help me as I draw the emphasis on the context of who James is. His life, the authority by which he held, and the humbleness by which he showed in the word of God, knowing this, that in all things we set the flesh aside when it comes to our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And remembering that we are not to be just hearers, but doers of the word. We love you. We thank you for all that you do and pray. Forgive me of my sins in the name of Jesus Christ for his sake. Amen. Many of you may not have known this, but Jesus Christ had half-brothers in this life. Did you know that? When he was born, he had siblings, he had a family. He was born of a woman, but the Bible says that there are brethren and there were disciples in his life. And many of you would probably not disagree with me when it comes to the fact when you get saved, some of the most difficult people to reach in your life once you come to salvation is your family. Now why that is to you may be confusing, but the Word of God reveals to us because Jesus Christ said in his last trip home, he said, a man is not without honor save in his own country. He couldn't even go home and witness to his family, and we're going to get into that here in a little bit. But I want to give you some context to who James is. James is the writer of the book of James. He's the great author of this book which we have here, this great epistle. And I want you to turn over to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 21, if you will, the book of Matthew. Make sure you keep a, a finger or some kind of marker in the book of James, as we may come back to it a little bit later. But in the book of Matthew, the Matthew is the first book of the New Testament just after the book of Malachi. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 21, the Bible says, And he said unto them, It is a candle. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong book. I'm in Mark. I flip back over to Mark. Matthew 4 and verse 21. The Bible says, And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to give you some notes here. There are four persons referred to in your New Testament by the name of James, and I want to go over a couple of these. Number one, James the son of Zebedee, an apostle according to Matthew 10, 2, and the brother of the apostle John, apart from whom he is never mentioned and with whom, together with Peter, he was admitted to the special intimacy of the Lord, as we can see in Matthew 17 and verse 1. The other, James, the son of Alphaeus, who was one of the twelve apostles, as we note in Matthew 10, 3. He's also called James the Less, according to Mark 15 and verse 40. James, the father of the apostle Judas, according to Luke 6, 16, there's very little mentioned about him. But then we go on to the James of which we're referring to who wrote the book of James. Listen closely. James, the Lord's half-brother. Isn't that interesting? Let me ask you this question. If your supposed half-brother come to you after 30 years of life, he said, by the way, I'm God in the flesh, I am Lord. I am Alpha and Omega. How honorable would you find yourself in that moment? How humbled would you find yourself? Would you bow a knee to your brother and call him Lord? How difficult that must have been. But you know, we find out that James initially rejected Jesus Christ, and it wasn't until after he was resurrected that he began to pursue on and move forward for the cause of Jesus Christ. I want to give you a little bit here. The, he's the half-brother of Jesus Christ. And he's mentioned by the Apostle Paul. Turn your book to Galatians, if you will. Take your Bible and turn the book to Galatians. These are the opportunities in the evening where we really get to dive in and 
move around. Sometimes in the mornings, I don't have you all turn your Bible as much unless the Lord leads. We get to several scriptures. But tonight, I want you to flip through and look at it with me. I want you to be there. I'm not just going to quote it for you all the time. I want you to look, dive in. I was talking to Sister Jasmine earlier this afternoon, and I said in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved. We need to study. Look through these scriptures. Get familiar with your Bible. Somebody says, how do you turn right there? Because I've spent time flipping through trying to find it. Amen. I'm figuring things out. You've got to study your Bible. Know where it's at. It's always a blessing when someone asks a question. You can say, hey, brother, here it is. Hey, sister, look, I know where it's at. It's right here. In the book of Galatians, in chapter 1, I want you to look at verse 18 and 19. The Bible says that after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none save, he says, only James, the Lord's brother. So now we know Paul referring to here that saved James besides Peter. They were there in support of the ministry of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And Paul even says it's James, the Lord's half-brother. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was also the mother of James, and that's referenced in Matthew 13. Take your Bible and turn there for me, if you will. In the book of Matthew, in chapter 13 and verse 55, listen, if this hasn't got you excited just yet, I don't know what will. Who in here knew that James was the half-brother to Jesus Christ? Amen. Praise God. Let's keep looking. Matthew 13. In verse 55, the Bible says this. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? There it is. So now we have a list of brothers and James is among those. By the way, in Matthew 13, 55, according to the book of Matthew, it was the last time that Jesus ever went home to Nazareth. That was his last occasion before going to the cross. You know what the Bible says about that sudden fellowship that he had there, that, that great fellowship with his brethren, that family reunion? The Bible says they rejected him. They didn't accept him as Lord and Savior. They denied him. Is, that, is not this the carpenter's son? Can you imagine if a man on your street that you watched grow up, he come home and claim to be God's son, and you said, is that not the plumber's boy from down the road? Nazarenes wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ. They watched him their whole life grow up and still rejected him. I had a man tell me one time, he said, if I could have just been there when they crucified Jesus and seen all those things, I would have believed. You know, my response was, no, you wouldn't have, because all those that were there didn't believe. How do you know that for sure? Is it not just enough to hear the gospel of Christ and receive it by faith? You think you have to be there for that? What if you were among the crowd screaming, crucify him too? James says, I don't believe that you're the son of the living God. I don't accept that. Hard to accept, especially with the animosity between brothers. Let me reference to you why James is called the half-brother of Jesus Christ. They had two different fathers. Joseph is not the father of Jesus Christ. God is. Jesus Christ said, I and my father are one. James is his half-brother because Joseph was his father. And what's interesting about Joseph is you don't hear much about him in the New Testament. After Jesus Christ is born and Jesus goes on to his ministry, as Jesus honored and respected his father, as a matter of fact, in the book of Luke, when they went in for that great feast there, they leave, and his parents are a day's journey looking around trying to figure out where is Jesus Christ, nowhere to be found. There's a young boy, the Bible says around 11 or 12 years old. So they had to travel back a day's journey. You know where they found him? They found him in the temple teaching. And the Bible says that men were astonished at his doctrine. You know what else it says? Jesus Christ looked at his parents and said, Wished you not that I be about my father's business? He said, Where did you think that I was doing while I was here? Do you think I was toiling? I was playing with toys? What did you think I was doing? While you were a day's journey away, do you think I'm wasting time? I'm doing what God asked me to do. And here's an amazing thing, and we don't see this with most kids nowadays and their parents. The Bible says he went back and was under subjection to his parents. We know he honored his father, Joe, his stepfather, Joseph. But it wasn't his father. The Bible says, Jesus said, I and my father, God, are one. Joseph was the father of James. Now, not much is said past that, but we know that Jesus Christ respected his earthly father, Joseph. But he wasn't his father. James did not believe in Jesus as the Lord in his earthly ministry. And I'll give you an example. Turn to the book of John, if you will, in chapter number 7. An early record here in the book of John in chapter number 7. 
I want to read to you verse 1 through 5. The Bible says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now these Jews, the Feast of the Tabernacles, was at hand. His brethren, not his disciples, his brethren, not the Jews, his brethren, his family, the Bible says, therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe him. James didn't believe him. He would have been included in that brethren. James refused to believe him. Now the gospel distinguishes between his brethren and his, and his disciples. Look at John chapter 2, just a few chapters back in verse number 12. We've just seen the descriptiveness there between disciples and brethren. John 2. Verse number 12, the Bible again says, After this he went down to Capernaum, and he and his mother, and his brethren, and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. A great distinguishing factor between the three. John 7, 3 and 5 does it. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, I'll read that for you real quick. Acts 1, verse 14, the Bible says, These all continued with one accord, that's together, in unity, in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. So James wasn't converted until, the resurrection of his, until his resurrection of his brother Jesus. And that we can find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 7. So we know he rejects him now. Now Jesus Christ has to go to the cross so James later on writes a book or an epistle, which is one of the earliest epistles that we find in the New Testament. And he writes this book. So at what point did James accept his half-brother, Jesus, as his Lord and Savior? 1 Corinthians 15. The Bible says, after that he was seen of James, then all of the apostles. So James has to have gotten word that his brother died. How many of you wouldn't get word that your brother died if he died? You'd get word of it, wouldn't you? And you've got to know that such an event as the crucifixion of Jesus Christ had to have generated some news. And it did, and it got around to his brother James. But we see that James sees him resurrected from the dead. And between this point in time, as Paul gives mention to the fact that James sees his brother resurrected from the dead, he sees Jesus... And he later joins the apostles in the work of the spreading of the gospel to all the Jews, which would eventually lead to the gospel and to all the Gentiles as well. Acts chapter 1 verse 14, which I just read, provides the evidence that James began to follow the Lord's work with his apostles. And thank God for that. Because James is writing by the inspiration and says, do not just be hearers of God's word. It's not enough for you to come in and hear God's word. Somebody can't walk out the building this morning and say, my, what a great message. I heard it, yet I rejected it. I'm not going to do it, but I heard it. There's a great difference in your ability to hear and your ability to do. James later goes on and argues this point. He says that you are not saved by your works, but when you begin to work, it shows the evidence of your salvation. What does that mean? James says if you get saved and you don't do any works, what point or what good does that do you for the evidence of your salvation is the bursting desire for you to do things among the community among the others that need it somebody says well i'm saved but i've never witnessed to the first person and i go to church once a year james says listen you're boasting in your own self you're a hearer alone and not a doer of the word of god when the disciples wanted to go out and begin to spread the gospel when jesus christ ascends back up into heaven the second time do you know what they said how will we know them how we know them, Jesus Christ said, by the fruits, by the things that they do. Now, we don't work for the, for the specific fact of boasting and seeing what we can get done or how many people are going to admire what we do, but we do the works of God because inside of us is made a transformation among all transformations. You're a new creature, the Bible says. You know what creature is a, a, a notion of? It's a notion of creation. And we see only evidence that God can create as according to Genesis. 
the great creation of all the worlds. And then he does something else. He goes on later in the New Testament and says, I'm going to create a new creature inside of you. That's the evidence of God's great creation. And thank God for that. We see in Acts chapter 12, verse 17, if you turn there with me, that he was a man of, a, of authority and he was exhorting his brethren. Acts 12, verse number 17, the Bible says, But he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went unto the other place. This is Peter's miraculous freedom from prison. And he goes and says this, Go show these things which God has done for me unto James. James was a man of authority because he was following in what God would have him to do. And Peter makes evidence of that here in verse number 17. Paul and Barnabas, as they seek to settle the debate among believers regarding the need for circumcision according to the law of Moses... All of these things are happening right here in the scriptures and James is at the very center of it. James is seeing all these things come to fruition. A couple of additional references to the man James and his surrender unto the work of his Lord. You can see that in Acts 5, if you will. Turn your Bible to Acts chapter 5. A little bit of that debacle here at the council I'm going to mention to you. Acts 5. In verse 21, it says that when they heard that they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught, but the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of the Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now, when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priests asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in the name, in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, doctrine means teaching, and intended to bring this man's blood upon us. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. So we see these men going about, doing everything they can, even being released from prison just to administer the gospel, the teaching of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. You can later on see in the book of Galatians, back in chapter number 2, if you'll turn back there with me. But back in the book of Galatians in chapter 2, again, verse 6 through 9, the Bible says this, But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference, adding nothing to me. But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. This here is behind the scenes at the first church of the council of Jerusalem. But all these references to those apostles that were there, and we know that James was the servant of God, he says in verse 1, back in your text here, if you'll turn back with me. So why am I referencing these scriptures according to the church at Jerusalem? Well, James says in verse number 1 in the book of James, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. I have you know this, that James was the original leader at the church of Jerusalem. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine seeing the great humility of James as he puts all matters of the flesh aside and renders the authority of his surrender unto his Lord, his half-brother? He mentions nothing of his earthly relationship 
or his brotherhood to Christ, Jesus, yet he refuses to know Christ after the flesh and places himself on the same level as all of you and I that sit here today. He doesn't brag or boast or make mentions. Hey, look, don't you know that I'm his half-brother? No, he says, the Lord Jesus Christ to whom I'm a servant of. He surrendered his life to his own half-brother, who he doesn't claim as his own half-brother. You'll never see him mention that. Why is that? Because he sets all flesh aside and says this, he is my Lord and my Savior. Now, if James wasn't a testament, a testimony or a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know who could be. Can you imagine? You bowing your knee to the God of gods who is your half-brother? How incredible that is. Now, this epistle can be totally broken up between five different sections. The first section could be the testing of your faith or the testing of faith itself. Section two could be divided at the reality of faith, tested by one's ability to bridle your own tongue. What does that word bridle mean? That means to control what you're saying from your mouth. The Bible says the power is in the tongue. There's a lot of things you can say that either hurt or affect positively or negatively someone. Do you know the Bible says with the mouth the confession is made unto righteousness? Your words have a lot to do with who you are. Words and your confession has a lot to do with who you become as a Christian for the Lord Jesus Christ. It also goes on to a third section you could consider the fact that it's to rebuke worldliness. It warns those who are rich in the fourth section. And finally, the exhortations in review of the coming of the Lord. Notice it doesn't say his half-brother. He says, no, the coming of the Lord. He writes this epistle to call upon the Jews, Jews who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and are living a life inconsistent with their profession of faith. Now, here's what I want to render unto you before we close tonight. James chapter 1, verse 22 I want us all to say it together real quick. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You know what James is saying here? He says the profession by which you've given unto the Lord Jesus Christ better match what you do. How does somebody know you're a Christian if you don't tell them? They can see it evidentially in your life. You know how many times somebody may not be able to witness or give a testimony unto somebody in the time they have to speak? Or maybe somebody sees you walk, but here's the testimony you can have in your walk of faith for the Lord. Can you imagine if somebody come to church and all they did was ever talk, but they never did? They said, Brother Joe, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I told Brother Heron I was going to go over and help him with his yard. And we're going to go witness to his neighbor. And guess who doesn't show up at 4 o'clock? So and so. You and I both know we can look at somebody if they did something like that and think to ourselves, oh boy. They're nothing but talk. They say things they wish to do, but they don't do them. How sad would that be? I believe one of the greatest testimonies that you all have for the community is this, not in what you say or what you hear, but in what you do. What does your life look like? Sometimes you've got to get right before a mirror and ask yourself, am I doing what the Holy Spirit penned to paper here in the book of James? Am I living the life consecrated unto the Lord? Am I sanctified unto him and him alone? Sanctified means to be set apart. We've looked at that before. Is your life totally separated? Are you still conformed to the world or are you transformed by the renewing of your mind which Jesus Christ has given unto you? Because James says this, he was once my half-brother whom I rejected and now he is my Lord whom I've surrendered my life to and went through beatings and slander and all those things just to see the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom advance. Brother, if you'll come, sister, if you'll come, I want you to really consider the idea of the book of James. James has so much to offer you as a Christian. And I would even dare say that some of you can go home tonight and begin reading through some of James. And when you get to 122, I want you to try to commit that to memory. Don't just be hearers of what, of what you're listening to in church. How sad would it be for all of us with everything exciting going on? I had a young man reach out to me this afternoon and said, I couldn't believe when I walked outside and saw all the cars out there. If we don't continue to commit ourselves to doing for the Lord Jesus Christ, Ashton, instead of just being here, do you think the church would grow if we're just having people hear the word of God, not going out and say, hey, Jasmine, you got to come to church. I got a church for you. Now, how many of us can do that? All of us can. That's why the Bible says, be a doer of God's word. Everybody stand, if you will. I'm going to pray and we're going to sing a song of invitation. The song is, is it 277, brother? Page 277. I'm going to say a quick prayer. And if your life doesn't line up 
with what you, you should be doing in your walk in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd ask that you give an opportunity to lay that down at the feet of Jesus and think about what your life is, what you want it to be. Are you really living as a doer for the Lord Jesus Christ? My Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you for all that you do. I pray you continue to watch over us and be with us, Father, in all things. I pray you continue to bless this church. We thank you for the great crowd of people that was here this morning and for the great amount of cars that were lined up in the parking lots, Father. And we just pray that every Sunday we see a great amount of people lost and saved that would come in richly looking forward to the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached. We'll lift up your son, Jesus Christ, in all things, Father, for it is him we pray. In his name, amen. Page 277, if God's dealt with you, come. If not, that's perfectly fine after this. When I have Sister Jasmine come forward, I want to share something with you.